writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Stay tuned for this episode as we talk about discipline in writing. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, author of Crazy Things, president of St. Louis Writers Guild, president of Whiny Trails Media, and also voice actor, which also means I do book narration as well as animation, voices, commercials, and everything else. And with me today is, of course, my lovely co-host. Hi, my name is Kathleen Cayembe. I write speculative fiction. You can find my uh, most recent short story, The Fairy Tree, on um, Lightspeed Magazine's website as of November 1st. Um, you can also find my paranormal romance under Kaseka and Vita, which is actually a lie you can't right now. But I also do freelance editing and run writing workshops and clearly uh, forget things and stumble and whatever. Sorry, I'm a little, I'm a little, uh, off today. Uh, hi, my name is Chanel Achan. I write science fiction and fantasy, and I also stumble and forget things. Yeah. And yay, she didn't just say, I write things. I I'm know. excited. Hold on. Oh, sorry. Uh. <laughs> oh, okay. Fedora Amos. I write Victorian who done it, like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis and Mayhem at Buffalo Bills West, Wild West. And coming in a year or two or ten is <laughs> my newest book, which is on a um, uh, five star. It's called Have Your Ticket Punched by Frank James, Brother of Jesse James, the Smart Brother. I'm also president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime. I'm Melanie Lucas. The sound effect you just heard was our plot cat. I believe it was probably Pumpkin. But we have a couple other plot cats, so it could be either, any of them. And that was Pumpkin and Mark deciding have to have a discussion. We too, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I am uh, very slowly and undisciplinedly uh, working on a fantasy novel. Here, here. Okay. Yeah. And also with us today, on visiting us from... Afar. Actually, he just doesn't feel like spending time with us in face to face. Doesn't love us. I know. It's Actually, the one. I'm saving you having to edit out all my coughing. Uh, the the mic mic muting helps that. <gasps> I had uh, no idea. You're doing it so well. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, I'm Brad R. Cook, uh, and when I'm not coughing my brains out, I am writing, and generally that is uh, historical fantasy. Uh, I.e. Steampunk, you can check out the Iron Chronicles, uh, which is Iron Horseman, Iron Zulu, and Iron Lotus. Uh, the complete trilogy is available on my website. And then also, uh, do check out Steam Tree, which is a middle grade coming this November. Either just released or will release. Check it all out at bradarker.com. Sounds good. And today we're going to talk about the, probably what I consider to be one of the most important topics in writing, for what, for what that's worth is discipline in writing. Because, point blank, if your butt's not seated, or if you have a standing desk, doesn't matter, preferably if your butt's not seated and you're not typing, your writing doesn't get done. So today we're going to talk about a few things. I'm going to talk about, personally, I'm going to talk about how to break your discipline and the fight that comes with recovering it. We're going to talk about what you know how disciplined we are. And we're going to talk about some ways to improve our discipline, maybe seeing tricks we share with each other here today that you might hear for the first time, or what else we can do to improve our discipline with writing, or is discipline even really needed? Am I just smoking something? And, you know, we need, and discipline's really not needed in writing. So let me throw that first question out there. Does it count if I can see that you're not smoking right now? Why well, I never smoke. Well, that I I never smoke anything since. <laughs> I was, I'm, it's okay. I know. I know. I'm, I'm I'm playing straight man to your question. Aww. 
So, is discipline needed? I mean, do do you <laughs> do you just wait around for the muse to talk to you, or do you just write, or what do you do? Um, <laughs> I think that depends on what your goal for writing is. If your goal is to have a creative outlet, I'm not sure discipline is needed. If that's your goal to be creative, if that's your only goal, if you're if getting published and having other people read your finished work is not particularly important to you, then yeah, write whatever you feel like it when the muse takes you. If you don't care about finishing, then discipline doesn't particularly matter. <laughs> True, but if you are trying to, depending on what road you want to go down, be it traditional publish, self-publish, or if you want to be a hybrid combination of the two, you need, you want to have your books finished and you're trying, to hopefully, to live eventually on the income coming in, which is controlled and so forth. So there and then there. Well, just one really okay. quick thing. Claire Applewhite, who has her own publishing company, mm -hmm. which is Smoking Gun Publishing, says when people ask her, what is the secret of writing, she says, finish the damn thing. <laughs> Agreed. Just wanted to put that out and support you. There you go. And a shout out to Claire. Well, um... So, discipline is great. Um, habit seems to be the term that serves me better. Uh -huh. Because, depending, like, like it's, if it's for myself, if it's a deadline I've set for myself, I will not be disciplined. Like, if it's not something that has an external deadline or external accountability involved, then my discipline is nil. Because it's it then just feels like it's just for me. And... I disrespect myself and my rules for myself all the time. I am supremely disrespectful to me in a way I am not to other people. So if somebody else sets a deadline or if it's like, this story needs to be into this person by this time, mm -hmm. it gets done. It gets done with a quickness. I don't need to exercise anything that feels like discipline. It's just, it has to get done. Work mode, it gets done. On the other hand, what helps me as far as writing, which is something I'm trying to reestablish for myself, is habit. Habit doesn't feel like discipline to me. It's more at this time and on a, this day, like at this time every day, my writing brain kicks in and I want to be writing. So I found that um, if I just do the habit, if I just do it one day, my brain automatically the next day wants to do the same thing. And if I give in to that, I've started forming a habit and it gets easier. It doesn't feel like discipline. But if I don't give in to that, the writing kind of just lounges and then the urge to do it the next day steadily decreases. So, so you make it part of your lifestyle. Yes. For me, discipline is whatever. I need to make it a habit and it needs to be built into my life. Otherwise, it doesn't get done if it's, if it's not something with an external deadline. Brett? Uh, so I would totally agree that uh, there is a bit of habit that is more important than discipline. Uh, discipline would imply that at any moment I can sit down and write. Uh, habit implies that every day, as Kathleen was saying, every day I'm going to be sitting in the same place at the same time and writing. Um, for me, I find that habit is the best, uh, you know, kind of like producer for me. Um, but really, it is that it is still a discipline. It's knowing that every morning I'm going to get up, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write, and every evening I'm going to stay up really late and I'm going to keep working in, you know, the time that I can allot to writing and uh, editing and publishing and marketing. Uh, throughout the rest of the day, uh, I will devote what I can, and that gets shifted around a lot. But my writing time, and you'll hear a lot of writers talk about this, is sacred time. Uh, so... It is the time that I have found that my muse and I work best. It is the time when I have the least amount of distractions, or at least I know I can cut off all distractions. And then uh, I'm not going to say that I produce all the time at that particular moment the best that I want to do, but most of the time, uh, you know, my, my muse and I are going to get along and I'm going to produce some words or I'm going to go through some pages. Um, and for me, the big one is... Uh, editing and writing so as yeah. the way all kind of you know writers have to go now um, is trying to find time to both produce new content and get content ready to publish. Uh, so that is also a discipline and 
That I would say is actually more of a discipline than a habit. Kathleen? Brad, as someone who really, really, really loves systems and has absolutely zero systems for creating <laughs> new content and getting work out there, and as someone who has noticed you seem to do both of those things pretty well, what is your system? How do you create the sort of situation where you do both of those things? Um, so I have a dedicated time every day, uh, which is the morning, um, we'll just call it the morning for lack of a better, uh, actually giving you a set time when it is, it varies slightly from day to day, depending on what I have to do. Uh, but the morning is pretty sacred to me to, uh, writing or editing or whatever I have to get done right now. Um, as you were saying with deadlines, deadlines are important. I love having a deadline. I also love the whooshing sound they make as they fly by <laughs> uh, you know, but it's true. So I love my deadlines and I know that I'm going to hit near them. <coughs> uh, and that is, that helps keep me on track, but really it's about knowing how to break up my day between, uh, editing, marketing, or, or I should say writing, editing and marketing, um, which are kind of the three craziest hats that every writer has to wear. Uh, and I will fully admit that on any given day, it's about what I feed, which beast I feed more. Um, and that comes down to where I am in the year. If I am trying to get something published like I am right now, uh, marketing and uh, writing are kind of out the window right now as editing and everything. Um, I should say marketing is there, uh, but really it's editing, getting everything ready for publication uh, for Steam Tree. Uh, that is what I do pretty much every day that I wake up. That's the first thing I'm going to do. And it's the last thing I'm going to do before I go to bed. Uh, so that's the, the set time right now. Uh, after Steam Tree comes out and I'm focused on marketing it and all that kind of stuff. And I wake up every morning and know that I have to try and figure out like if there's a book reviewer I can contact or if I can try and go after this ad or this contest, that'll all become part of that. But that will take a side to writing. Uh, and I will wholeheartedly jump back into writing because I'm not doing as much of that right now. And it, I can feel it, uh, that I'm not writing as much as I would like to be because I'm currently focused on getting steam tree out the door. Uh, so for me, it really is about knowing which of those three beasts I'm going to feed that day and then trying to balance that out in a week so that I can know that yesterday I was really big into marketing. So today I really need to buckle down and finish that chapter that I need to write. Uh, and then obviously right now it's all about getting through, uh, editing rounds, uh, you know, and then getting them back to people and then getting them back. So there's that whole craziness, but it's about knowing that's my system is knowing which beast to feed that day. Brad, do you suppose you could ballpark it and tell us like, is it one hour for this and two for that? Or what does your total writing day consist of time-wise? Uh, so in terms of writing, uh, I generally, it will be about two hours in the morning of straight work. Uh, and then I will switch it up because usually at that point I'm sick and tired of looking at words. So I will try and do something else, marketing or some otherwise. And then that goes on for uh, maybe a half hour, hour, and then I switch back and keep working and that usually fills up till lunch or right after that and then my afternoon is filled generally with real work other work stuff like that and then take a little time off at night and then about 10 a.m or 10 p.m uh i will launch back into work and try and figure out exactly uh what i need to do that evening and then that becomes how much of a day i've had how stressful is it if it wasn't a stressful day i will write all night if it was a stressful day I might uh, create some marketing images or something like that because art is uh, less intensive on the mind. But I, it's uh, about blocking. It's about blocking out that morning in about a two-hour block, uh, about three to four hours, maybe five hours total. If I can get in a really good day, that'd be a really awesome day. Uh, but really, it's that two hours and then an hour doing something else and then coming back for an hour. Or so. And you never sleep, apparently. Mm -hmm. No, there's 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 a few hours of sleep there. 
It's a nice yes. nap in between uh, my nighttime work and my morning work. <laughs> uh, so something that I'm finding difficulty with <laughs> is um, I need more sleep than it is clear to me now that Brad gets. <laughs> I need much more sleep than it is clear to me now that Brad gets. I also, um, I work a day job and I'm horrible at mornings. So what I've found as far as my own natural rhythm is what my body naturally wants to do is, all right, fine, I'm awake, go to work, work for like four hours, around like noon, one o'clock, two o'clock, my creative brain immediately just like comes on and it's like, we want to be writing now. I would love to clock out of work at that time, write for a couple hours and then clock back in and stay late. But that is not a thing that I'm allowed to do. Right. No. So... I can write to be honest I like so I used to work in the corporate world which means that uh you know my day was very regimented and I woke up every morning went to work and then stayed at work all day mm -hmm. and then came home that evening yeah and uh I will admit that it it totally cuts into a day job in any way shape or form will totally cut into your working time really? um, <laughs> and that's actually where I found my nighttime working uh really came into effect and I, I'm kind of a night owl anyway uh, but what I didn't tell you, uh, is that often my morning does not start at like 7 a.m. I don't, I don't start at like 7 a.m. That is not when the beginning of my day is. My day can, if I've worked really late, my morning is not until late morning. Uh, because you have to, I have to get in like six hours of sleep at least. Um, so I understand some people are 10 hour sleepers, some people are more. Um, and that's just a thing. But for me, it's, uh, when I first wake up in the morning, I am the most productive and knowing that means that whatever I have to get done that day, if it's a day job, if it's, uh, you know, publishing or whatever, that's kind of the first thing on my plate because my brain is the freshest. Um, and then late at night I get really creative and that's when I like to do that kind of stuff. So, so kind of about knowing your rhythm. My day job hates my rhythm. Um, <laughs> my day job is designed to destroy that rhythm. Um, yeah. Because I'm, I'm not really a morning person. I like being awake in the mornings. My brain is not completely there yet. So <laughs> what, what ends up happening is I get to the day job. After a few hours, my brain is like, okay, I'm in now. I'm here. Let's do something fun. And I'm like, but I have to do some more. I have four hours left in the work day. And by the time that four hours left in the workday is over, my brain is like, okay, we're on the drive home. We can think about writing. You've got the, the story out on. So I'm completely in story mode. And then I get home and I have to do a number of things before I can relax. So all those things steadily chip away at story writing brain until I finally sat down. And then I'm just like, I would like to be dead now. I understand that I have to eat dinner but I do not think I can move anymore. I will just sit here and sit here. <laughs> so the way that my life is right now is pretty much a creativity killer. Uh -huh. And I do need a certain amount of rest time um, that is completely different from writing time before I go to bed. I have found this out because when I do start writing immediately when I get home, after that's done, I'm like, okay, downtime bedtime? Why? So for me, the problem that I have with creating a disciplined writing life is that I do need downtime and I do need a lot of sleep and that doesn't, and my natural rhythm works counter to my day job rhythm. So I want to know how you guys even balance all of these no, things. I was just listening to your description. I was just wondering if you had ever tried having an audio recorder set up in the car and talking through your stories as you're driving home or dictating your stories. Well, I, I have started using, well, I started using voice memo a while ago and I've noticed that there's a different program that I downloaded that records my voice better. When I play back things on voice memo, it's really soft, but I mean, I work better typing out stories than I do talking them out. Uh -huh. which is something that I've learned about myself. So I will record, um, 
I will do speech to text mm -hmm. when writing notes to myself in certain situations. The problem is I can't do speech to text in my car because it's connected via Bluetooth to the car. So it's real weird. I have to type in the car or record. And then if I record, I have to transcribe and ask me something I hate doing and never ever do. Transcribe. Yes, I'm the worst. Also too, I'm gonna to take that question as well. Um, I actually tried to do a record, record while I was driving. Most of the time, I'm going to clean this up because we are PG-13, the words that came out of my mouth was, hey, you stupid idiot, I was driving there, rather than about my story. And where I'm kind of going with that is, some people can do it, and I think it depends on when, you're dri when and where you're driving, but rush hour, you need your attention on the idiots around you. And I don't recommend the secondary distraction. Not mm -hmm. saying it. Not saying some people can do it. And Brad, go for it. Yeah. No. Uh, I I love thinking about stories when I drive. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not my time to try and record them, though. Right. Um, however, what I was going to say though is, and this is my point, uh, we're talking a lot about discipline and a lot about that, and we're talking a lot about daily habitual writing. That is not necessarily the only way to be a writer. Um, for a lot of people, because we all have stressful jobs and everything like that, you may only get one or two or three times in a week. It may only be one time a week uh -huh. uh, that you have to write. But if that's true, lock that time in. That becomes sacred time to write and produce words and get it out of you and do everything like that. And you're still going to produce a book eventually. Uh, you know, the same way that a daily writer or, you know, in my case, a guy who writes pretty much five days a week because I take the weekends off, uh, usually because I'd have to go do something, um, you know, uh, some convention or some craziness somewhere. But the point is, is that that makes you a, a habitual writer. That is, that is habitual writing. That is disciplined writing. If you're taking that one day a week to write. Um, and, and the beauty part about that is, and this is what I highly recommend, is that you gear up for that one day a week writing. So you spend the rest of the week figuring out exactly what your plot is and what it all is going to be. And then that way, when you sit down at that one point and during the maybe two or three times during the week, then you can sit down and know what you're going to write and the words will flow out of you much, much faster. Um, so it can also be about that. It can be about knowing that you have just that one moment to write and using the rest of the day and your writing brain when it does kick in and be creative uh, to start thinking about what you're going to do when it comes time to actually sit down. Um, I cleaned and Chanel and myself. So while I was at Clary, we, uh, a group of us were talking about this sort of thing because like everybody had day jobs and some of them had similar problems to me. Like where do you find the time to write the amount of time that you want? Like some of the, some of the, my cohort were similar to me in that my ideal writing chunk is like two to four hours like that i will sit down and two to four hours later i will resurface and that is that feels best to me and one of them said well i'm a weekend writer and basically during the work week he didn't have the time to devote to writing that he wanted and so he wrote on the weekends and he said maybe you'll have to be a weekend writer and um I thought that sounded good, but I had never before heard, Brad, what you said about, you know, gearing up for it during the week and thinking about what you'll be writing that weekend so that when you sit down, it's already come out. Thank you. Exactly. No, that, that's, that's how I write. Even though I write every day, like, I don't, you know, I, I don't spend the, the two hours that I sit down every day to write that I'm guaranteed this is my this is my writing time. I'm not going to do anything else. I'm not going to pay attention to anything on Facebook or anything until this time is over with. Um, and the, with the, what I do with the rest of my day, uh, when I'm driving, when I'm in the shower, when I'm just walking around, when I'm just sitting there thinking, is I'm thinking about what I'm going to write when I sit down next to write. The plot, the characters, it could be you know researching some obscure little fact, it could just be thinking about how I want the characters to go and how I want that scene to go or how could that scene go. And then that way when I sit down to write, uh, it's kind of like my muse and I are already on the same page. We just have to shoot it, knock it out, and you know, then the producers are happy, and we all get to go home, and you know, uh, the you know, big studio is happy. It just all happens. That's all in my head. So, uh, you know, it works that way. Chanel, 
okay, plotty big plot of study. <laughs> so, here's the thing. I personally am not very much a plotter. It doesn't work for me that great. Like, if I'm going to, if I want to tell myself a story, it gets told once. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it loses the magic. That's just the way I work. Um, so, I, while, while that's really great from a plotter perspective, some of us more pantsier people um, can't really accommodate that and be able to be able to produce the amount and the caliber of work that that we would like. Because I can have two hours set aside, and if I'm sitting there pecking at a keyboard for you know one hour and thirty minutes of that two hours. I might as well have not written. For me, once again, this is not everybody, this is just me. Um, now, I'm the type of person that, like, if, uh, like, writing comes on me like the Holy Ghost, it just, it just happens. It's just like, oh, Jesus, take the wheel, I gotta I got write this down. <laughs> so, um, that also, in my opinion, does take a certain type of discipline um, to be able to, instead of just leave that in your head, so, well, what about if this happened, you know, that'd be pretty cool. That'd be, yeah, and then you could do that. And yeah, that'd be really interesting. And then by the time um, you get to your writing hour or whatever, it's gone. That happens a lot. Um, the discipline, taking the discipline of whenever this happened, whenever the Holy Ghost hits you, you have to be able to stop what you're doing and get out a pen and paper and write it down mm -hmm. or write down enough of it to be able to recapture that fire uh, once it hits you so, so that you can be consumed again. I feel like that's another type of discipline. Not quite the same type that you uh, are fond of, Brad, but I think that is a, a, <laughs> quite a, a, a different type but also useful type of discipline. I would completely agree with you on that, actually. Uh, that, uh, knowing when to write, like when, to, like when that inspiration smacks you in the forehead and it's time to start putting that down, like knowing when to capture that and how to capture that is a huge discipline that I myself have to struggle with because uh, I will think of awesome things and not have anything to write them down with and then I have to try and hold on to that until later and that is really, really hard to do. Uh, in fact, I have a story that I came up with in DC off the elevator ride that we had every day and I, I'm really, I haven't written it down yet and I'm cursing myself for doing it because <laughs> it's freeing my head quickly and I need to get it out and down, recorded. Um, Chanel, I'm really glad that you brought up that as a kind of discipline, because that's something that I used to do all the time. I, I carry a notebook and pen everywhere I go, and I carry a smartphone with me, and recently I've started using my smartphone to capture ideas as I have them. But I haven't been writing as much as I used to do when I was in, in high school, when I was in college, when I was in elementary school. And something that I realized I used to do was when I had an idea, I would immediately start writing it. Oh, yeah. And oh. as I have ventured out into the real world and had to go to a job and had to stay doing the job instead of following where the spirit moves me, I have trained myself out of the habit of doing that. Um, I may jot a note down, but I won't jot down enough to recapture the fire, which is the important point. Mm -hmm. So when I went to Archon this year, um, to be on the diversity panel, I got to go around the convention and kind of see some other panels. And uh, Donna J.W. Monroe, I believe her name is, ran a writing workshop. It was prompts based and it was wonderful. And what she did was something I used to do. She put out images that were fascinating of all types and she said, pick an image um, and now you're going to write for 10 minutes. You're going to write a story based on that image. And it was so much fun. I used to do that all the time. I have a folder on my computer called hooks that are just for those sorts of images. And after I left her workshop, we did that a few times. I noticed um, after I left her workshop, I was more inclined to do that again. So for a week or so afterwards, if something popped up on my desktop background and I wanted to write about it, like the spirit was moving, I was like immediately pull up document, start writing. Um, and I did that a few times and it was great. And then I was like, you're clocked in. <laughs> so I had to stop. Mm -hmm. I had to stop. But just that willingness 
to go where the spirit moves you, when it moves you, to immediately say, yes, I will do this thing. I will do it now. Um, that is a type of discipline. And I know because I have had it and then trained myself out of it, and I'm trying to train myself back in it. Mm -hmm. It takes dedication to do that. Fedora, myself, Brad. I think there's more than one kind of discipline that will serve a writer well. Yeah. And you were talking about retraining yourself because it seems to me, at least in my own thing, <laughs> that the time I spend in front of the computer is, of course, very important. And I'm very consistent in doing that pretty much every day. But even more important, really, is the time I spend thinking about it. And I find that I can do that in two different segments on any given day. One is when I'm exercising, whether it's walking, I walk three miles, or going to the gym and, and doing those mindless kind of exercises. And uh, your brain is certainly capable of counting the reps while you are thinking of something else. And the other is I try to focus on what happens in the next scene just before I go to bed and my subconscious works on it at night because there's one thing that's true here whether you're a pantser or a plotter it doesn't matter you have to know what happens in the next scene if you're going to write it and that is what you can train your brain to do I think in times when you are doing more automatic things like putting the dishes in the dishwasher or running the sweeper or whatever that is just a chore that you don't really have to think about doing. You can engage your brain if only you say, yeah, okay, I'm sweeping the carpet, which does not take but uh, maybe 1% of my brain. So what is my scene for tomorrow? What is gonna happen? Drain it. I totally agree. And there's some videos out there on Quentin Tarantino about how he does his writing and it's really interesting. Actually, I shared that off my Facebook page not too long ago. And I say not too long ago because while this is being recorded on October 15th, it's not airing until November. I want to say I record. I shared this back around October, between October 10th and October 15th. But what he does is he will, basically he writes, then he goes and relaxes and does whatever. And during that time, he's taking notes on what's going to be next so for him to write next. Um, I am going to throw out a book that I'm going to suggest people take a chance and read. I will warn you, it is out of print. So if you try to buy this book, you're going to pay a pretty penny. And good luck on, on finding it through Interlibrary Loan. It is out there. It is called Secrets of the World's Best-Selling Writer, The Storytelling Technique of Techniques of Earl Stanley Gardner by Francis L. and Roberta B. Fugit, F-U-G-A-T-E. For those who don't know who Earl Stanley Gardner is, one, I guess you haven't been listening to our podcast too much because he is a literary hero of mine as far as a writer, but he wrote underneath just his name was Perry Mason. He wrote under multiple pen names. He wrote for television. He wrote for radio. He wrote novels. In 19... As of January 1, 1979... The man had an estimate, estimated 310,910,603 copies of his books out there. At one point in time, he was said to have been outselling and out, outselling the Bible itself with his work. The man had a, an annual goal of 1,200,000 plus thousand words a year. <laughs> I ran into this book when I was 22, or a younger man. I was, I was in college, so I probably was about 19, 20, 19 or 20 years old. Well, I discovered this book. 19, 19, 19, 19. <laughs> yes, I am an immortal. There can be only one. That's why Brad and I fight so often. Off and where are they now? <laughs> yes. Anyway, um, and I ran into this and. This book became kind of a foundation for me developing my own discipline, which was going great <laughs> up until about 2006. And it really broke around 2010, 11, somewhere in there. Um, point blank, I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning, 
would write my butt off until I had to go to that daytime job. I would write at lunch. People were always surprised I had a laptop open on the lunch table and I'm typing away with my earphones on and ignoring everybody. And then I would type when I get home, write when I get home, edit when I get home, whatever. And I would write until about eh, 11 o'clock or midnight. And then once again, I'm up at 4 o'clock the next day. Earl Stanley Garner says that basically you don't need as much sleep as you think you need. Yeah. Okay. He, well, and he, he was proof of that. He also compared our minds to horses. If you don't tie it up to the hitching post, it's going to go wander away. And in modern day with Facebook and everything else that's out there for us to go wander away to, yeah, that makes pretty much sense. But right now, I for the last 10 months, I've been rebuilding my discipline. I've been refining it because it got broke. It got broke drastically. It got shattered. Yeah, it got shattered into tiny little pieces that even made Humpty Dumpty dump, go, go, yeah, Humpty Dumpty go, oh, thank God that wasn't me. Um, two things were occurring. One was a job. I did like Brad. He was in corporate world, so was I. Um, my job was not eight to five. My job was... At times, for months on end, seven days a week, get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, work till about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, go to sleep, repeat. Holidays were non-existent. I would have New Year's Eve off. I would have Martin Luther King off. And the next guaranteed holiday that I would have off is Thanksgiving, which is, for those who are living outside of the United States, is November. So I'm January till November. Um, high pressure. High demand, basically, there were people without wanting to do their jobs, so I got dumped on our department to do, and which means it was left to two people to do, myself and my boss, which I can't complain about. My boss and I were shoulder to shoulder, arms rolled up, our sleeves rolled up, and going at it, trying to do it. And we would be talking at Sunday at 3, in the, 3 o'clock in the morning, going, okay, this is what we need to do tomorrow because we have this to do. Uh, add to that was a sick mother who I took care of, who ended up developing C. diff, which, God, I pray, none of it, nobody who's ever listening to this gets that. If you type into Wikipedia C space diff, D-I-F-F, you should be able to find the actual full name of this bacteria that's actually in all of us. When we take too much antibiotics, this thing gets released. Well... C. diff basically causes, among a lot of things, causes diarrhea. Bad diarrhea. My mom was 220 pounds in, which before she got it, which was June of one year. By August, she was down to, call it 140. Yeah, great weight loss system, not. Um, by the time she came home and for six months, she was actually in, there's a long story, Make a long story short, she went to a hospital for a um, problem with turn with diabetes, which we found out was the cause of a big problem. But she has some undetected fractures, which they wouldn't listen to. Me, who was her um, caregiver, or, and also her medical power of attorney. And these went undetected until June. <coughs> and she was in a um, recovery, basically a skilled nursing facility, for a while until October. Basically, from makes it easy Halloween until Easter the following year. I was, if anybody has ever had a baby, you'll fully understand the demands that are put on you by having to wake up throughout the throughout the day, the morning, the evening. You never know when, and take care of said baby. Now picture that baby being a hundred and forty, hundred and fifty pound adult. And you you left out the part that she came home. Yeah, she, well, I did. I said she came home in October, and she still had this. And the first nights of sleep I actually got, first time I actually got more than one hour of sleep at a, in a, in a row, was Easter Sunday. And I actually ran up, I, I lived downstairs in the house, because I needed some privacy. And we, I usually operate, I could usually hear her, which, by the way, Melanie... Um, drives her nuts because I'm such a light sleeper. Um, but I would hear her or listen from a cell phone all night for when this would occur. 
And when I woke up, I was like, oh my God, what the hell happened? I ran upstairs the first night she actually had slept through. But that experience between those two events completely shattered that discipline. And now I'm having to try to recover that. I think I'm finally there at that. Um, I say I think. We'll see. Because I used to be a high producer of words. I used to have... It would be nothing for me to get 5,000 word short stories out per week, written and edited before that. Um, so we'll see where I'm at now. That's because I've I've gotten I've lost that job. I'm not complaining about that, and um, I'm determined to make this on my own. And that discipline is required if I'm going to do this on my own. Go ahead. I know for um, Brad, you're waiting, but Kathleen's got a dovetail. Mm -hmm. um, something that occurred to me while you were you were talking about your productivity before and trying to recreate that sort of productivity is that um, for me, what I realized that my writing discipline actually was, um, mine was broken by, you know, carpal tunnel and depression mm -hmm. and uh, having a day job. But um, what I started recognizing was that I wasn't any more disciplined a person in elementary school, in high school, and college than I am now. My, who I am as a person and how I operate in the world has not changed, but I do have certain strategies, certain systems that I employed when I was at those ages that would enable me to write when the spirit moved me. Um, I had habits about like getting on my computer immediately when I got home because I lived on my computer. If I wasn't reading, I was writing. I had a community of writers that I produced work for that was just fun. And I had a lot of online friends that I would talk to and our connection was writing, generally speaking. So I had a lot of different structures in place that enabled me to be a disciplined writer. They were habits and systems that I lost over the course of what I just talked about. And now the struggle that I'm having and the reason I feel like I'm not as disciplined as I used to be is that I don't have those structures in place. So while I still do um, have music that will be immediately get me in a writing mood for a given story, I don't have my computer set up so that I can just put those on. I don't use my computer as often because I still have carpal tunnel. Uh -huh. I can't write when the spirit moves me because I'm at work, things like that. And I don't have my community anymore because we've moved to different places online. So one of the struggles I'm having is trying to recreate those sorts of situations that enable me to be such a quote unquote disciplined writer in the first place. Brett? Uh, yeah, so um, first off, I wanted to throw out that uh, Earl Stanley Gardner and maybe even you, David, can pump out a million words a year. Uh, I, I am nowhere near that. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to throw out that, uh, you know, you, you like, word production is awesome, and word production is, it, it astounds me, like, when people have these massively thousands of words that they can pump out of themselves at any given moment. Uh, even though I'm a plotter and I know what I'm going to write when I sit down, um, I'm happy if I get, uh, I don't really tend to think of it in terms of uh, words per day. I tend to think of it in uh, how much of the story I got told. And my goal is always to do a chapter of one sitting. Uh, and my chapters tend to run like uh, five to ten pages, I guess. So, you know, extrapolate that out. That's only a couple thousand words at any given month. Like, and I don't always put that out in a single uh, session. So it might be that I write that same chapter for like two days. Um, so I, I just want to throw it out that, you know, your word production level uh, may vary from Earl Stanley Gardner's million words a year. Uh, and that's totally okay. Uh, and then the other thing I want to throw out is that uh, I think this might be true for all writers. Um, but I have never had a job where I did not get talked to about writing on lunch or writing when I was actually supposed to be doing something else. Uh -huh. um, so I, I, most of my jobs, especially the corporate jobs, I would always ask, 
you know, hey, you mind if I take that hour of lunch? And, and uh, right, because it's a really good hour that you can just do whatever you want with. Uh, and everyone starts off saying yes. Uh, that quickly changes when they realize, like, okay, you're weird, and now you're sitting at your desk typing furiously at another computer, um, which, you know, I work IT, so anytime you looked at another computer, everybody, like, freaked out. Um, but, yeah, so, uh, and then uh, I've had three jobs where that's become an issue, uh, me trying to write in the little moments that uh, I have between whatever else I was supposed to be doing. So writing at work is... Uh, I don't know, it's something I've gotten spoken to a lot. No, um, something that I do at work is I will eat lunch at my desk because we have a time that we are supposed to use mm -hmm. to take for, for eating. So I'll eat at my desk and work through that. And then when I'm ready to take a break, I, I lump in all of my break times and that lunch half hour all together. And I do whatever I want for that time. And sometimes that's writing. Sometimes that's playing mindlessly on my phone, but it's a much better chunk of time for me to write something than is, you know, just the half hour, just the 15 minutes. William McPee Thackeray, who was one of the top writers in his day, wrote exactly 1,000 words per day and would stop in the middle of the sentence if that made 1,000 <laughs> words. I do not hold with that kind of thing, and I do not hold with what I'm going to tell you about now. But I will say this, you can think of it like basketball players who use a smaller hoop inside the bigger hoop uh -huh. so that they can hone their aim uh -huh. for and find out what they're really all about. We are in the midst of NaNoWriMo month. Uh -huh. And that says that you should create 50,000 words in 30 days. That's a little more than 1,000 a day. Uh -huh. And if you miss a day, you have to make it up. I thought it was 50,000. It's 50,000. Oh, okay. It was in 30 days. In yeah. 30 days. Okay. What I'm suggesting is that if you have never tried it, and believe me, I don't plan to, but if you have never okay. tried it, I think it might be a really good exercise uh -huh. in creating a, an impetus for you to actually see what kind of output you can make. And it may be that uh, that doesn't work for you at all because it wouldn't work for me. But like the basketball player trying to put a ball through a smaller hoop, it's a good exercise to determine who you are and what kind of writer you are and therefore what kind of output you can expect from yourself. I'm going to come back to this in a little bit, but I want to go ahead and Kathleen and then Chanel and then me. Chanel and I are doing nano this year. Yes, we are. There you go. <laughs> and uh, I have tried nano on my own and with friends. I have won nano when I was living around a group of people and we would write together every night. I lost Nano when it was by myself because yes. I disrespect me. Yes. Um, it's much easier to be held accountable by people that will make you buy them things because you lost your word <laughs> war battle. <gasps> oh, yeah. You're going to institute that? Oh, yeah. But I'm so stingy. Get over it. We know that. Oh. Go, go, go. Oh. Sorry, word oh, wars. Girls. Loser. <laughs> word wars. Loser has to buy the winner a round, whatever that round may be. Um, but yeah, it's much easier to make and exceed your word count by trying to win word wars that way because competitive person is competitive. Um, Are you talking to me? No, Chanel is talking to myself. myself. But, uh, I'm it, sorry, I just saw a mirror between us. Bring it. We got this. Um, <laughs> we will reach 50,000 words by the middle of November. You heard this. <laughs> we'll hold you to that. Oh, I don't know about that now. She, she can do middle. I will hit it by the end. Well, okay. And this Bye. novel will be done. Yes, but it's easy. It's... Um, what, if, if you're a competitive person, knowing what and knowing what motivates you to write um, will absolutely get you to put the most words down on the page. Like if you're if you're not a competitive person, sitting there and saying, "Okay, we're gonna do word wars," you're just like, "Yeah, okay, I lost. 
that's, that's fine. It, it, it's not going to motivate you. You're not going to get the words down on the page. But that goes for a lot of the things that we've said thus far is you have to know how you work as an author. You have to know how you work as a person. Are you a morning person or are you an evening person? Mm-hmm. Do you get work done better Like when you're – can you do work in small, like, 15-minute chunks on your break at work? Or do you have to have that three- to four-hour span of time to be able to concentrate and get into your work? Are you – are you um, – are you a words per day person or are you one of those people that is I don't care so much about the amount of words that I get per day but if it's done in the tone of the story that I want and it's just you know a a half a chapter I'm cool with that knowing these things about yourself is going to make it incredibly well it'll make it easier (laughs) it'll make it easier for you to try and reach the goals that you have as far as productivity Go ahead and then let's see. Yeah, I was going to say discipline for a writer looks like different things for different writers. Absolutely. One thing I'm going to throw out there for word production, and what Brad said earlier, what Fedora has said too, word production isn't everything, guys. It does get the job done, but you may have a bunch of junk that you have to go through and figure out. Word production may not be your thing. But I'm going to tell you, if you want to increase your word production... And this is something which I've recently discovered with myself, (laughs) is that it is a lot like weight training. If you are training, if you are uh, to lose weight, I would do some weight training on how to do max lifts. If you do the same type of principle that weight training has, that that max lift has in training to your writing and apply that for a while, you'll find that you'll slowly see your word word amount increase. Now, with that said, you can also burn yourself out. Start slow. Start low. If you can only get 100 to 200 words done a day, hey, guess what? You got 100 to 200 words done a day. That's 100 to 200 words less, more than what you got than you would have done without doing it. You can get there. You can do it. Finally, everything with discipline that I'm going to say here is you've got to have a drive. What Chanel has said, what everyone else here around the table has said, you have to have a drive. Motivation is, excuse my language, bullshit. (laughs) Unless you have the engine that's called drive for it to fuel. Why do you write? Why do you want to write? I mean, are you wanting phys- are you wanting psychotherapy because of your writing? Well, you, you might want to go ahead and talk to a psychologist instead. Why are you writing? Why are you putting yourself through all this? And why, in the long run, do you want to see your words? I'm assuming everybody who's listening here is not a writer who is just writing for the fun of it, but is trying at some level on a professional side trying to get their words out in front of someone else to read. Why? And that why is your motivation. That why is your drive. Feed it with motivation and discipline. David, did you know that if you write just 100 words a day and are consistent, you'll have a book in two years? Exactly. Yep. That is why I have my own system, and I call it Baby Steps. Because I go by the ones. I believe in writing at least 100 words a day. Usually I write a little more than that, but if I write 100, I'm perfectly happy to go off and have breakfast or whatever else my day has in store for me. I try to, every year, get out one book. I don't always make that, but I always try to. And uh, sometimes get sidetracked and write a few other things along with it. I try to spend at, do at least one thing per week that has to do with marketing and promotion. And I go at least once a year to a writer's conference that is not local. Uh So that I can meet some people from around the country or around the world, someplace else, and talk to them and get some additional ideas. And it's just great to be around writers, whoever they are, including this group. And I will say that this group, also does a write-in once a week, so that's a little impetus, uh-huh. too. And something everybody 
could form a little writing group and have a write-in once a week. What's wrong with that? I totally agree. That's actually how this all got started. Thanks to my lovely co-host across the way, who doesn't come to the write-ins anymore. because they're at Caldi's. <laughs> they're not at Caldi's anymore. Where are they? Are they? We'll talk us? off mic. <laughs> 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 We will talk just, off my but they it's are a secret location. Yeah. Secret location. All right, so so just we'll one talk. of the things that I have recognized about myself as a writer is that it's things that work for me versus that don't. Um, so part of what makes writing so helpful is the built-in kind of discipline and accountability you have that you have to be able to write at them. Yeah. Yes, you do. People talking around you doesn't always help, and I do mean fellow writers, Brad, and then Chanel. Yeah, I was actually just going to throw out, uh, Fedora, you're in your company. Uh, John Steinbeck uh, famously said that if you write a page a day in 400 days, you'll have a novel. Absolutely. And, uh, that, that was his philosophy on writing and stuff like that. So there you go. Okay, I, I'm the anti-Steinbeck here. No, you're not. I'm with you. <laughs> I, 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 um, I don't do baby steps. I go all or nothing. Go hard and then go home. Right, go hard uh-huh. or go home. It's so like I, I write like a demon and then it's over. Right. And then you recover <laughs> mm-hmm. and get your electrolytes and make sure you're hydrated and, you know, that's that. But I, there are, like, once again, know yourself well enough to say, okay, am I the type of person that can do a hundred words a day or a page a day for however many days and have that be your thing? Or am I the type of person that has to sit down at a computer, be staring at the page, and then suddenly this urge to regurgitate things onto this page is there, and you just start typing, and then it's six hours later, and you're like, holy crap, what just happened? Oh, by the way, there's a short story there. Yep. Myself and then Kathleen, mine's going to be really short. I can't do the small words a day. I probably could, but I talked about that job I had. What it taught me, because even on, quote unquote, my vacations, if you want to call them that, I was on call. So I would have, so I would take all my vacations and I would be writing. But I'd be writing as fast as I could, but because the second that telephone rang, that cell phone rang, I was going to be tied up for six to eight hours dealing with something else. So it became a word story vomit yeah. onto the proverbial page. So that, that, but as bad as that is, that became, that's actually something really good that came out of that. Because that's taught me to be able to do that. Go ahead. Chanel, what you said about, like, it all comes on you and, like, however many hours later you got something done. (coughs) That's totally how I work, or at least how I used to work when I was able to work the way that worked for me. A lot of work, work, work. Um, So that is how I, how I would do if I could. Um, but I can't do that all the time. I don't have time to do that all the time. It is not realistic for me to think that I can do that all the time. And I've always held the, um, Amherst Writers and Artists, um, uh, philosophy a writer is someone who writes. Mm -hmm. So whenever I'm not writing, I feel like I'm somehow less of a writer than I am. And that's just the thing with me. Like if I, if somebody else told me this, I'd be like, uh-uh, that's not, that's not accurate. And I try and tell myself that is the case too, but I don't believe me because it's about me. <laughs> um, so what I learned from my friend MJ King, who's a writer, um, is baby steps. Uh-huh. So when I cannot do writing the way it works best for me, what I tell myself is if I write one sentence today, then I have written today. And I have to be okay with that. I have, I have tried. I have done what I am set out to do. Like, it doesn't always stay with that one sentence. Sometimes that one sentence turns into hours. And that's okay. But if that one sentence is all I had time for, I still was a writer today. Uh-huh. And I have learned to accept that about myself. So is a sentence always a story? No. Sometimes it's a line of a poem. Sometimes it's a journal. Sometimes it's literally... A spoken entry, it's a spoken entry on a voice memo app. Just the flowers look like this, you know, a description. And did I get to sit down and write the way I want to? No. But was I a writer today? Yes. And your brain was engaged Mm -hmm. as a writer. Yeah. 
that's, I think, equally important to having words on a page. Mm -hmm. So totally agree. that has been something that has allowed me to feel disciplined and feel like I am doing the writing that I want to be doing, even when I cannot do it to the extent that I want. I'm going to close this out here. We're going to go off of what Kathleen was just saying. Because she's not the only writer out there like this. You know, I do it to myself all the time. <clears throat> and that is to stay motivated, to stay driven, and to hold to your discipline. This is a part of that discipline, and that is getting out of your own damn way. And stop giving yourself guilt trips. Don't do it. Easier said than done. People, will, people, especially non-creatives, will not understand what it is that you're trying to do. They will try and compare this to corporate world. They will try to compare it to the sales world. Oh, how many sales did you make today? How many contacts did you make today? How many, what was your great output? And hey, I, you've heard me. I talk about doing big outputs. But overall, you are you. Don't kill the creativity inside of you. Feed it. Let it grow. Help it grow. And make that the biggest part of your discipline in your writing. Get it done. And with that said, have a great week writing. Tune in next week for yet another interesting topic in the writing industry. Thank you. The new theme songs for Write Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.